probably hasn't had a fresh coat of paint for about 100 years. So they've done a table, so I think this lot is next. There are lots of these little courtyards hiding around here in Berlin that haven't yet been repaired. If you've been here when the Berlin Wall fell, pretty much uh, whole areas of East Germany looked, or East Berlin looked exactly like this. Which is nice, because this hasn't changed a lot since what we're going to talk about took place. Um, the, uh, there was a workshop in here, which was owned by a guy called Otto Weit. And he was practically blind, and so were his um, workers. He employed blind and dumb people, who would work in his workshop making brooms and brushes and wooden goods. He was an anti-Nazi. He wasn't Jewish, he just hated the Nazis. And he was determined to do whatever he could to piss them off. And so, just to piss them off, he made sure that his entire workforce was Jewish. <laughs> Pretty much his whole workforce was made up of blind and visually impaired and dumb um, Jewish uh, workers. Now, as the war progressed, obviously, the Nazis tried to round up as many of these Jews as possible and take them off to the concentration camps, along with all the rest of them. But Otto Weick kept rescuing them. He hid his workers. He um, took them off to um, secret places. He paid for them to, um, you know, live in uh, secluded attics where the <laughs> Gestapo wouldn't find them. And uh, he once went down to a Gestapo office and picked up every single one of his workers who'd been arrested in a raid. And he did this by claiming that they were essential workers. You know, it's from like uh, Schindler's List. You know, they're essential workers. And uh, the SS said, well, how come they're essential workers? And he said, well, they're working for the SS. They're doing SS work. And it was true. The Jews who were working in here were making brooms and brushes for the SS because Otto Weit had the SS brooms and brushes contract. So the brooms and brushes that the Jews made here were then sent off to concentration camps and used to clear up there. So the Gestapo did release them. There is a story from one of the Jews who was imprisoned um, by the Gestapo during the war a couple of times. Otto Weid saved her a couple of times. She was called, um, she was called uh, Israel was her surname. She turned into a great writer after World War II. She went to live in Israel, appropriately enough. Um, Deutschkron was her surname. And she was uh, one of the workers here. And uh, she was hidden by Otto Weit from the Gestapo. And this is an example of the sort of stuff that Otto Weit would do for her. This is from her memoirs, which is called I Wore the Yellow Star. <clears throat> and she says, some days after going underground, right, going underground is kind of disappearing, changing your name, getting the hell out of it so the Gestapo don't find you. I heard Otto Weit at the front door of the office speaking with a woman whose voice was familiar to me, but I couldn't quite identify it. She asked after me and I grilled myself as to who it could be. Then I heard Otto Weid's voice. Uh, Frau Deutschkron? Uh, she hasn't come to work in days. What do you want her for? In a moment, I disappeared under my desk. I knew immediately that it was the wife of a neighbor in the house where we had lived. The mother and the daughter, Deutschkron, have disappeared and they haven't paid their electricity or their gas bill. They also took their house keys with them. Why are you coming here, Weid asked. Well, I saw that a few days ago, one of your transport trucks, trucks picked out their couch, and I thought, oh, Weit interrupted her. I just remembered something. Deutschkron didn't pick up her last paycheck when she disappeared. I could pay you for the bills out of that. How much is it? Frau Wachsmann, a great name, gave a price, and Weit told the accountant to pay her the money from an envelope that supposedly contained my salary. Are you satisfied? Weit asked the woman. Yes, but what about the house keys? Well, I'm sorry, I can't help with that, but if Deutron does come by, I'll be sure to tell her. Frau Wachsmann left the office happy. I crawled out of my hiding place. I was devastated. Weitz said, don't worry, you have to learn these things. Right, so if you're going to disappear, don't take your bloody house keys with you, because then the busy bozzy, uh, busybody landlord who rented out the house will come looking for you to get the house keys. Make sure you pay your electricity or gas. There's lots of other little things you have to remember as well change your name but don't change your first name because otherwise unless it's really Jewish because otherwise if you're walking down the street and some of your friends say you know oh you know hi there Alexa or whatever if you don't turn around and answer it looks really suspicious or if people are calling out your new name and you can't remember your new name for a moment and you only respond to your old name that looks suspicious as well keep the same first name that you always have there's lots of other little things that they had to remember and even then, if they remember all these things, it's still a really low chance that they're going to survive. 
And most of Otto Beit's workers were picked up sooner or later. He couldn't save them. He could save a few of them. Inga Deutschkron, who wrote this, figures out that you needed 20 Germans to protect you. 20 Germans who weren't Jewish. People to hide you. People to hide you in a new place. And the place after that. People to bring you food. People to make excuses for you. People to pool their ration tickets to make sure you had something to eat. And the chances of meeting 20 Germans in a row, none of whom were going to phone the Gestapo and report you, were really slim. That's why only a few thousand survived here in Berlin. There's a little plaque to Otto Weich right here on the entrance. 